We have a good sized group today. We'll give folks just maybe one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to start us off. It's 1031 and I know um, our presenter, um, Dr. Peck, has a lot of content to get through, so we want to go ahead and dive in. Um, thank you all again so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We know you're really busy, um, especially school nurses, counselors have a lot going on at the start of school, so thank you for taking an hour to be with us this morning. Um, uh, CSHA, the California School-Based Health Alliance, is thrilled to join with the California Alliance and the California School Nurses Organization to be co-hosting this webinar on current trends in adolescent substance use and effective engagement and treatment strategies with our presenter from UCLA, ISAP. Um, a big welcome to all of you. Let me just make sure I can move my slides forward. There we go. Um, this presentation is supported by your California, the Youth Opioid Response California, and a really big thank you to them for supporting this valuable work. Um, I'm Amy Ranger, the Director of Programs from the California School Based Health Alliance, um, and I'll be helping host. And Dr. James Peck is our presenter today. He's a licensed clinical psychologist and the senior clinical trainer at the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. Um, he has conducted phase two clinical trials of behavioral and pharmacological interventions for stimulant dependence. He has extensive experience conducting curriculum development, clinical trainings, and clinical supervision on assessment and treatment of substance-related disorders and the treatment of individuals with co-occurring substance-related and psychiatric disorders. He currently works at UCLA in a primarily clinical training role and maintains a busy practice treating individuals with co-occurring disorders. And he has presented with us many times before. This is actually part two of our webinar series from last week. And um, we love hearing from him every time he presents with us. We get lots of great feedback and people feel like they learn lots of relevant information. So we're thrilled to have him back. Really quick housekeeping. Um, if you're having a hard time hearing, feel free to dial in with a number on your phone. We will be recording not only the presentation, but the slides and we'll send those out right away along with the evaluation information and additional resources. So expect to get that email in the next day or two. Um, if you don't know us, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a nonprofit um, that serves the full state of California. We're dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children um, and youth by advancing health services in schools. And we do that in lots and lots of ways, including workshops like this um, and our upcoming virtual conference on November 2nd through 4th, um, as well as a ton of resources on our website. So check it out and get in touch with us if there's other ways we can be supported. Our co-sponsors today are the California Alliance and the California School Nurses Association, two of our strongest partners, and we're so happy to have their stakeholders joining us um, today. And I will pass it over to Jim. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Amy. And I'm going to share, oops, did you stop sharing? I okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, share some PowerPoint slide. Okay, should be all set. Good morning, everybody. Good Monday morning. Uh, as Amy said, thank you for joining us this morning. I know it can be difficult to focus on something like this, especially on a Monday morning. And, and especially given all of you are in the process of starting back to school. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to give you a start code for those of you who would like an hour of continuing education this morning, please write this down somewhere. Brandy will paste it into the chat box in about uh, in a few minutes. And then we won't be giving it out again after that, because otherwise we'd have people showing up toward the end wanting their continuing education units. So if you would like one hour of CE, please write down 4801. And I see Brandy just put it in the chat box. Great. Okay, so what we want to accomplish today is, is that after the webinar, you folks will be able to recognize recent prevalence rates of at least three substances that are commonly used by youth. We want you to be able to apply at least three strategies to help engage and retain youth in treatment for substance use disorders and traumatic stress. And we'll, I'll explain why I'm including traumatic stress uh, as we go. 
and to be able to identify at least two evidence-based substance use disorder treatment approaches that can be implemented with youth. All right, so we'll start with prevalence rate of drinking and drug use among adolescents. And I've pulled data from NIDA's Monitoring the Future study. This is from 2019. Uh, a lot of what I'm gonna show you is from 2019. However, in areas where there's been substantial ch significant change from 2019 to 2020, and we have that data, I will, I've added that in as well. So there will be some data here from 2020 as well. Monitoring the Future is a survey of eighth, 10th, and 12th graders uh, conducted by researchers at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, for the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is uh, one of the NIH institutes. And the survey has been going since 1975. About 42,000 students from uh, almost 400 public and private schools participated in the 2019 survey. So to start us off, in terms of illicit drug use, um, illicit drug use held steady from 2018 to 2019, past year use among 12th graders. The majority of that was marijuana. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, any illicit drug that includes marijuana is 38% of 12th graders report past year use. Any illicit drug not including marijuana, about 11.5% uh, uh, reported among 12th graders. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that the majority of that was marijuana. Followed close, not closely, but followed after that, strangely enough, by LSD. And then synthetic cannabinoids, which are things that uh, kids call things like spice uh, or K2. And then cocaine, MDMA, which is uh, essentially ecstasy, and then heroin. Daily marijuana use in lower grades increased but past year marijuana use held steady. So if we look at the daily marijuana use chart, we see a significant increase among eighth and 10th graders between 2018 and 2019. So the gap is narrowing between 10th grade and 12th grade, meaning that more 10th graders are actually using it. Uh, the past year marijuana use, you see the same thing. The gap is closing between the older grades, uh, meaning more 10th graders are using it in addition to 12th graders. If we look at cannabis use 2019 to 2020, that essentially remains steady. Uh, there wasn't a significant difference between 2019 and 2020. Uh, about 35% of 12th graders report past year marijuana use. About 7% of 12th graders report daily marijuana use uh, as opposed to past year, but even on the past year marijuana use side, even 11.4% of eighth graders uh, and 28% of 10th graders. So those are fairly large numbers. Prescription drug misuse uh, has continued to decline. Prescription opioid use in particular has continued its decline from its peak years, which were around 2010. Uh, and that mirrors the availability in the general population of the prescription opioid painkillers as we have kind of clamped down on those, we see less and less use uh, among adolescents as well. So Vicodin past year use continued to go down. Oxycontin, uh, same thing, past year use continued its decline from its peak. Adderall uh, misuse sees uh, significant changes in the past five years, uh, decrease in 10th and 12th grades, but an increase in eighth grade. So if you look at the eighth grade columns, the yellow is 2014, the dark blue is 2019, and you'll see uh, Adderall use among eighth graders almost doubled between 2014 and 2019. Whereas among 10th graders, it actually declined from 4.6% to 3.1%. And among 12th graders, it declined from 6.8% to 3.9%. The concerning thing here is that it increased among eighth graders. Um, so more Adderall misuse among eighth graders. Uh, continuing a trend of amphetamine inhalant and cough medicine misuse uh, trending upward among eighth graders. If we look at cough medicine, amphetamines, and inhalants, at, in 2020, there was 
in a significant increase in all of those from 2019. If you look over on the kind of the right hand side of this graph, uh, you see all three of those uh, went up significantly from 2019 to 2020. Um, that's concerning, obviously. So that's amphetamines, inhalants, and cough medicines. Uh, cough medicines often contain uh, things like codeine, which are addictive opioids. Alcohol use continued to, to decline uh, in all three grades. Past year alcohol use uh, sees a uh, significant decline in all three grades. Binge drinking, which is reported as five or more drinks in a row in the past two weeks sometime, uh, also has been declining since 2009, continued to decline through 2019. Uh, that changed a little bit in 2020. Uh, the gradual decline in alcohol use slowed down and kind of tapered off between 2019 and 2020, both in terms of binge drinking and in terms of past year out reported alcohol use. So 20, they had been declining, and then from 2019 to 2020, uh, they, that leveled off, which is, may not be such a good sign. Tobacco and nicotine, uh, vaping threatens progress. So if you look on the left-hand side, daily smoking is the little uh, yeah, white and light brown uh, bars. And daily nicotine vaping, which was measured for the first time in 2019, is the other series of bars that you see. And as you can see, vaping vastly outpaces uh, cigarette smoking. Among 12th graders, there was a significant decline from 2018 to 2019 in daily, reported daily smoking. So that was, that was good news there. Cigarette smoking in the past month has generally been declining over the past 10 years. Um, there's a significant decline from 2018 to, 20, to 2019 among 12th graders in particular. So good news on um, cigarette smoking, not so good news on vaping. Daily, again, daily nicotine vaping, which was measured for the first time in 2019. Uh, 12th graders, almost 12% of, of 12th graders report daily nicotine vaping. And in past month, use of nicotine vaping goes up to 25% among 12th graders, about 20% among 10th graders, and a little under 10% for 8th graders. That equates to one in four 12th graders uh, who are vaping nicotine. That's not a good sign. Uh, and one in five 10th graders and one in 10 8th graders. THC vaping or marijuana vaping. Uh, past month over on the left-hand side has increased, uh, increased up through 2019. So that 12, uh, 14, about 14% 14 of 12th graders uh, are reporting past month uh, THC vaping and 12.6% of 10th graders, almost the same number of 10th graders are reporting uh, past month THC vaping as 12th graders are. And that 20, 2018 to 2019 increase is the second largest one year jump ever tracked for any substance in the 45 year survey history. Uh, nicotine vaping was the largest from 2017 to 2018. Daily THC vaping was measured for the first time in 2019, so there are no numbers to compare it to, uh, but you can see about 3.5% of 12th graders report daily uh, marijuana vaping or THC vaping. The reasons that teens report re for vaping, uh, to experiment, to see what it's like over on the left-hand side of the chart, uh, is about 60% said just to experiment, to see what it's like. About 40% said because it tastes good. A little under 40% said to have a good time with my friends. Uh, a little under 40% said, said to relax or relieve tension and the, the number reporting that reason increased by more than a third from 2018 to 2019. So you've got more teens saying that they're vaping in order to relax or relieve tension. In other words, for, to relieve anxiety. Um, that's not such a good sign. 
Again, as, as I said on Thursday, uh, some of the data that we're seeing suggests that teens are learning at a younger age to use substances to self-medicate essentially for anxiety or depression symptoms. Uh, about 30% said to feel good or to get high. That was up significantly from 2018 as well. Uh, a little under 30% said because of boredom, nothing else to do. Uh, about 15% said because it looks cool. And then under 10% said because I'm hooked, I have to have it. That's a low number, but it more than doubled from 2018 to 2019. A few said to help me quit regular cigarettes and a few said because regular cigarette use isn't permitted. So the, the, where there was a significant increase was to relax or relieve tension, to feel good, to get high, or because I'm hooked, uh, I have to have it. Some changes during COVID uh, is one of this, these numbers uh, just came out, which just published. Alcohol, cannabis, uh, adolescent cannabis use and binge drinking didn't significantly change despite the perception among adolescents that availability had decreased. So cannabis perceived availability, uh, those seeing it as being very or fairly available, decreased from 76% to 59% from 2019 to 2020. That's a significant decrease. The perceived availability of alcohol went down from 86% to 62%, saying that they perceived it as being very or fairly available. That's another significant decrease. These, these represent the largest year-to-year, one-year decreases in perceived availability of alcohol and cannabis since 1975 when they began the survey. Despite decreases in perceived availability, the use of alcohol and cannabis didn't change. And the authors of this study concluded these findings suggest that reducing alcohol, adolescent substance use through attempts to restrict supply alone would be a difficult undertaking. The best strategy is likely to be one that combines approaches to limit the supply of these substances with efforts to decrease demand through educational and public health campaigns. So just trying to limit supply is not likely to be an effective strategy. Um, I found an interesting article uh, that reported school-based health centers, providers, attitudes, beliefs, perceptions, and practice regarding opioid misuse um, that was just published this year. I thought all of you folks might be interested in it since it's directly relevant to what you do. Um, one of the, some of the things that they found in this paper that only 8% of adolescents who need substance use disorder treatment ever receive it. That unfortunately mirrors the adult population in which a very small percentage of folks who probably need to be in substance use disorder treatment actually receive it. And part of that is because of the lack of availability with adolescents in particular, a lack of availability of adolescent specific treatment settings. Uh, some of that is because people uh, don't perceive that they need help or treatment. Um, only 1% of the 38,000 physicians who are wavered to prescribe buprenorphine are pediatricians. So as you know, I'm sure physicians, NPs, and PAs can get wavered by the FDA to prescribe buprenorphine as a treatment for opioid addiction. Only 1% of the physicians currently wavered are pediatricians. So, so the availability to uh, adolescents of buprenorphine is very low even though the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, Committee on Substance Abuse has recommended the use of buprenorphine for uh, adolescents 16 and older who are addicted to opioids. Youth who go to adult substance use disorder programs typically experience poor outcomes because adolescent specific needs are not addressed. Again, they're, they're sitting in with adults. Um, they're very different developmentally. Many adolescents engage in at-risk alcohol and cannabis use, which almost always precedes the initiation of opioid use. Somebody asked on Thursday, uh, why, why do you say that alcohol and cannabis use usually precedes prescription drug use? Um, and that's the case with opioids. It's not necessarily the case with things like Adderall. Alcohol and cannabis use don't necessarily precede the use of um, of things like Adderall. As we saw at eighth graders, uh, an increase in use of Adderall, they're not all using alcohol and marijuana as well. 
So the study was conducted with school-based health center providers in New York State. Uh, some of the attitudes and perceptions regarding the opioid crisis that were reported, 77% uh, of them said that opioid overdose is a major health-related crisis for adolescents in this country. And 82% of them said my school-based health center has a role in preventing opioid misuse and overdose. However, only 49% of them said I have the skills to prevent opioid misuse and overdose among my students. And only 34, about a third of them, said I am confident in my ability to prevent opioid misuse and overdose among my students. So there's a perception that the op opioid, uh, opioid epidemic and overdose issue is a major issue for adolescents, but many people working in school-based health centers uh, either feel like they don't have the skills to do it or they're not confident in their ability to do it. Some perceived barriers to implementing opioid misuse and overdose prevention services in school-based health centers. 37% uh, adolescents said adolescents in my SPHC face other more pressing health concerns. So in other words, there's not enough time probably to deal with it. 34% said substance use treatment providers are better suited for this role than providers in my school-based health center. 26% uh, said I don't feel confident in my ability to prevent opioid misuse and overdose. And 24% said I'm not trained to deliver services that prevent opioid misuse and overdose. So again, perception that opioid overdose uh, and use is an issue for adolescents, but a number of barriers exist to implementing opioid misuse and overdose prevention services in school-based health centers. The greatest influence uh, of specific messages, this is the same study, uh, the greatest influence of specific messages on the adoption and implementation of SBIRT, which we talked about on Thursday. Uh, SBIRT can prevent adolescent opioid misuse by reducing alcohol and cannabis use, again, because an alcohol and cannabis often precede the use of opioids. Standardized screening tools provide a simple way for assessing risk and determining an appropriate level of intervention. And the SBIRT model can incorporate other behavioral health concerns, such as depression and anxiety. Uh, we can, we'll talk a little bit about screening for depression and anxiety along with alcohol and drugs in SBIRT uh, in just a minute. So some information from the uh, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, they work not only on childhood traumatic stress, but on mental health and substance use issues connected to childhood uh, trauma. Um, we know that for those of you who are familiar with the uh, ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, we know that there is a, a huge connection between the experience of adverse childhood events and alcohol and drug misuse, as well as mental health problems down the road. So in terms of engaging and retaining youth in treatment, whether for substance use or mental health issues, adolescents often don't believe they need help. They're apprehensive about the process. They're not aware of available services. They're concerned about the stigma surrounding substance use and or mental health services, and or they are hesitant to ask an adult for assistance. So to identify youth in schools who may need help with substance use or mental health issues, Want to use standardized screening instruments like we talked about on Thursday, the CRAFT or the S2BI or both, the PHQ-2 or, or PHQ-9, which screen for depression. You know, it's only it, PHQ-2 is just two questions that screen help screen for depression, and the GAD-7, which screens for anxiety. And you can use these together. You can do uh, screening, standardized screening for alcohol and drug use along with alcohol, anxiety and depression. Um, and that may not be a bad idea because it, it helps to normalize the questions about alcohol and drug use because you're also asking about depression and anxiety. Utilize peer networks. These are student leaders who have been trained to provide assistance to at-risk teens. This is becoming, peer recovery is becoming a more and more, uh, more and more focused on topic with adults in terms of uh, utilizing peers as part of the treatment process. So peers would be people who have had these problems themselves and have uh, successfully overcome them and can provide uh, counseling and assistance to folks who are at risk 
uh, or who are actually misusing alcohol and drugs um, by being peers, by uh, be- befriending them, by kind of taking them by the hand and saying, okay, here's, here's what we can do with this and it's not so scary uh, and you can recover from this. Can you use something called the Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools, the CBITS, to identify traumatic stress, which often accompanies substance use. So as I said, we, we know that traumatic stress, adverse childhood experiences are often going along with substance use. Substance use typically doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, it's happening because of what's oftentimes what's going on uh, at home uh, in the family structure and dynamics, and often there's uh, trauma going on there. Engaging youth. There are frequent high rates of no-shows at first appointments, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, Strategies are to make lots of reminder calls, make multiple reminder calls. Try to be especially welcoming at the first session. Praise them just for making it to the appointment. And to the extent that you can, be culturally aware and sensitive. Uh, Beliefs and attitudes toward mental health and substance use vary from culture to culture. And in some cultures, mental health is more stigmatized. In some cultures, substance use is more stigmatized. In some cultures, both are stigmatized. And so it's important to be aware of that and be able to talk about um, mental health and substance use issues in a destigmatizing way. Engaging homeless youth. Uh, There are higher rates of substance use and mental health issues among homeless youth than among youth in stable housing, not surprising. Some strategies to engage them. Stay at their level during the first contact. Uh, If possible, demonstrate that you're familiar with their culture. And part of that is the culture of being homeless. Um, And so demonstrate that you are familiar with the many challenges of being homeless. Avoid blaming them reframe their current situations like drug use or living in a shelter uh, in non-judgmental, matter-of-fact terms rather than as personal failures or family failures. Convey hope and empowerment. That's a really important one. Uh, We often don't think about conveying hope often enough, uh, but oftentimes treatment providers need to convey a sense of hope as well as empowerment. Uh, believing that change is possible. You can change this. With, my, with our help, uh, I believe that you can do this. And respect their concerns regarding confidentiality, like contacting parents or caregivers and doing that according to the, uh, the laws and regulations in your state. And as Amy mentioned on Thursday, there are specific uh, laws and regulations around confidentiality and youth Uh, with regard to consenting to mental health or substance use disorder treatment. Involve families to the extent possible. So adolescents with caregivers involved in the treatment process tend to have better outcomes than those whose caregivers either don't believe treatment will help or are unwilling to work with treatment providers. And there are some specific strategies for involving families in treatment. Foster family motivation. Determine what changes the family members would like to see and try to incorporate them into treatment goals. Validate parents or caregivers. Acknowledge their sense of stress and their own struggles because typically they are undergoing their own stress and their own struggles. And provide education about the nature of mental health and substance use issues like the fact that behavioral or emotional problems may not just disappear if the adolescent stops using drugs or alcohol. In fact, if that's the expectation, that's not going to be helpful to the family. Um, Families need to be educated that if anything, behavioral or emotional problems may actually get worse when adolescents first stop using drugs or alcohol because they may very well have been self-medicating for those underlying problems uh, with drugs or alcohol, and they may actually get worse uh, when they initially stop using drugs or alcohol. Build an alliance, establish rapport, find out what the adolescent would like to talk about so that they don't feel like an intervention is being imposed upon them. Uh, Show genuine interest in and respect for his or her unique interests, concerns, and worldview. And again, if possible, demonstrate an understanding of their culture. Discuss the limits of confidentiality uh, at the beginning of treatment. Plan with the adolescent how information will be communicated and what information will be communicated to parents and other authority figures. 
and reassure the adolescent that if you must disclose information, you will make every effort to talk with him or her before you do it. Um, and just like with adults who we believe are dangerous to themselves or others, and we need to make a report uh, or we need to, need to make a report to uh, child, uh, child Protective Services, something like that, talk about doing that with the client in the room. Um, reassure the adolescent that if you have to disclose something, like you feel like they're a danger to themselves, that you'll sit down and talk with them about it uh, before you do it. And if any, if at all possible, you'd like to have them in the room when you make that phone call. Okay, so two treatment approaches for substance use disorders that are adaptable for use with adolescents are motivational interviewing and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So we'll talk about uh, each of these in a little bit more detail. Motivational interviewing is a client-centered style of interaction aimed at helping people to explore their ambivalence about their substance use and begin to make positive behavioral and psychological changes. In the last iteration of the textbook in 2012 uh, of the motivational interviewing uh, textbook, Miller and Rolnick defined MI this way. Uh, MI is designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. There's a lot of really important language in there. Strengthening personal motivation for, that assumes that there is some level of motivation there if we can help people to identify it, and then if we can help people to strengthen it. Commitment to a specific goal. That goal may be stopping substance use. It may be cutting down on substance use. It needs to be the, uh, the client's goal and not the goal that we are imposing upon them. Eliciting and exploring their own reasons for change. So rather than being a sort of a luxury approach here, I'm gonna tell you why you ought to make this change. We're gonna to try to elicit from the client, uh, from the adolescent, their own reasons for change. Why might it be beneficial for you to cut down or stop your substance use? And we're doing all of this within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. One of my favorite sayings uh, is that it is true, it is a paradox, but true nevertheless, that acceptance facilitates change. In order to help people make changes, we need to first accept them, meet them where they are. Concept of motivation. So motivation as being a state rather than a trait. We used to think about motivation as being more like a trait, uh, something like a personality trait that's kind of deeply ingrained and resistant to change. Now we think about motivation as being more of a state uh, and a state is fluid and changes over time. Therefore, motivation can be influenced by the clinician's style of interaction with the client. Motivation can in fact be modified. And so the clinician's task is to elicit and enhance motivation. And this last bullet point can be challenging for people sometimes. Uh, lack of motivation, what we used to term lack of motivation is a challenge for the clinician's therapeutic skills, not a fault for which to blame our clients. That's not saying that we're solely responsible for our client's motivation. It is saying that if this person is reacting to me in a way that seems resistant uh, or like they are not motivated, let me take a step back in the moment and say, is there something about the way that I'm being with this person that is eliciting this response from them? And is there something in my way of being that I can shift that might elicit a different response from them? So it's a challenge for our skills, uh, not a fault for which to blame our clients. Four aspects of the underlying spirit of MI, partnership, we're meeting people where they are and forming a partnership with them to identify the problem and work on it. Acceptance, as I said, we're meeting people where they are, uh, accepting them for who and what and where they are so that we can work with them. We're doing that in a genuine spirit of compassion, actually caring about this person. Uh, and evocation, we're trying to evoke from them their own sense of values and goals and their own motivation for making a change. So on one hand, you're telling me that you want to finish school so that you can go to college. On the other hand, you're using Vicodin every day. Um, let's talk about that. 
for processes of MI. And, and again, this, as I said on Thursday, this is a very brief overview of MI. We do day long trainings on just on MI. Engaging, just building the therapeutic relationship, um, focusing on building that therapeutic alliance focusing the conversation on the specific goal. What is our goal going to be here? And again, it needs to be their goal, not necessarily your goal for them. Evoking a sense of, again, values and goals, as well as a sense of what are their own reasons that might motivate them to make a change. And then planning, breaking larger goals down into smaller pieces uh, that people can work on on a daily basis um, to work toward that larger goal. What's the best way to facilitate change? Constructive behavior change comes from connecting with something valued, cherished, and important. And very often when people first come into substance use disorder treatment in particular, they have kind of lost touch with themselves. They've often sort of lost touch with what do I value? What is important to me? And so part of what we can do with them is to help them rediscover those aspects of themselves. What's, what do I value? Uh, what is important to me? Intrinsic motivation for change, so change motivation that's within us, comes out of an accepting, empowering, safe atmosphere where people can be honest with themselves. So very often people are uh, not being honest with themselves, especially around substance use, and pulling that intrinsic motivation for change, identifying it and then pulling it out and strengthening it, comes out of creating an accepting and empowering and safe atmosphere. Safety is really important. People need to feel uh, that they're in a safe, safe physical space, but also a safe uh, emotional and behavioral and psychological space. Ambivalence, feeling more than one way about something, right? Um, we used to think about people coming into substance use disorder treatment as being, you know, amb ambivalent, and that was that would augur uh, poorly for motivation. Now we think about ambivalence as being a normal part of the process. On one hand, I know this would be healthier for me, would, be, would allow me to accomplish some goals. On the other hand, it's gonna be really difficult. There are some strong things that are tying me to this behavior. Uh, and so it's going to be on one hand, I should do this. On the other hand, I don't want to. Students typically come into healthcare settings with fluctuating and conflicting motivations. Um, like I said, on one hand, they, they want to make a change. Uh, on the other hand, there are some reasons that are going to make that change difficult. So MI says that working with ambivalence is working with the heart of the problem. So we're trying to help people work with their ambivalence about change, resolving that ambivalence in the direction of making the change. The provider interaction style with the student uh, is non-judgmental and collaborative, so we're building a partnership uh, between the student and the clinician. We might call it gently persuasive. We're not gonna do any lecturing. We're not going to drag people kicking and screaming in the direction we want them to go in, but we might call it kind of gently persuasive. It is definitely more supportive than argumentative. The, the moment you get into an argument with somebody where you're saying that they have a problem, they're saying they don't have a problem, uh, you're not likely to get very far. We're doing more listening rather than telling. As I said, it's not a luxury sort of approach. We're doing a lot of reflective listening, which we're gonna look at in a minute. And the entire approach communicates respect for and acceptance of students' feelings and their worldview. How do they see the world? We're exploring the students' perceptions without labeling or correcting them. We're not doing any teaching or modeling or skills training, although, if you're combining MI with CBT, for instance, cognitive behavioral therapy, you might be doing some teaching or modeling or skills training uh, along with it. If you're just doing a pure MI approach, then you wouldn't be doing any of those things. Resistance, again, what we used to term resistance, uh, is seen as an interpersonal behavior pattern that is influenced by the clinician's style of interaction. So again, rather than, we, resistance used to be met with confrontation. No, you're wrong. Don't you, don't you understand how wrong you are about this? Um, instead, we're going to meet resistance with a reflection instead of confrontation. So something like, 
I can sure understand why you see it that way. Um, would it be okay if I share with you a slightly different way of looking at the situation? I'm asking permission before I share that perspective um, that communicates respect for the student uh, and gives them a choice in the matter. Four basic principles of MI, expressing empathy. So we're building uh, an empathic relationship where we're genuinely trying to understand this person. Again, who is this person? How did they get to be where they are today? And where is it that they might want to go? We're developing discrepancy. Again, that discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behavior. On one hand, you're saying you wanna finish school and go to college. On the other hand, you're drinking several times a week. Help me to make sense of that. And we have to be very careful with our tone of voice when we say that type of thing. Um, have to be very neutral, non-judgmental, and, and genuinely curious. You know, it's like, okay, this doesn't make sense to me. Help me to understand this. We're rolling with resistance. As we said, instead of confronting resistance, we are rolling with resistance and maybe inviting the student to look at the situation from a slightly different perspective. And we're supporting self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a sense of if I decide that I wanna make this change, do I feel like I have the necessary knowledge and skills and experience to do so? We can use the decisional balance. Sometimes if you only have a short period of time to spend with someone, uh, this can be a useful conversation to have. Tell me some of the good things about your, whatever it is, your drinking, your marijuana use, your Adderall use, whatever it might be. What are some of the good things about it? What do you like about it? They're not expecting us to ask that question. They're expecting us to tell them why it's bad for them, right? So by asking them what's good about it, what's that communicating to them? That I'm genuinely trying to understand them. Help me understand what need this fulfills. Help me understand what role this plays in your life because I just want to understand. And then what are some of the not so good things about it? And we'll say not so good rather than bad uh, because it's, it's less judgmental, conveys less judgment. Um, and the, the entire MI approach is designed to keep people's defenses down rather than raising their defenses up. Then we would ask them what would be some of the not so good things about cutting down or stopping your use of alcohol or drugs. Not so good things about cutting down or stopping are gonna give us the challenges. What's gonna make it difficult for them? And so maybe then we can help them develop some coping strategies for dealing with those challenges. And then we're gonna end up the conversation on what would be some of the good things about making that change, about reducing or stopping your substance use. We wanna end the conversation on what would be some of the good things about making this change. We're asking open-ended questions, we're using affirmations, we're using reflective listening, and we are summarizing, and those are the four MI micro skills. We're also gonna use something like the readiness ruler. So on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you? You might use any one of these three. How important is it for you? How confident are you that you can do it? and how ready are you to make a change in your drinking or your drug use? Responses tend to range between four and six on these questions. And so then we're gonna ask, so why didn't you give it a lower number? So you gave it a five. So why didn't you give it a lower number? What are people expecting us to ask them? Why didn't you give it a higher number, right? In other words, why isn't it more important to you? It should be more important to you than that. If instead I ask, why didn't you give it a lower number? I'm asking them to focus on what makes it important enough to give it a five? What are those reasons? Have them talk about those reasons. And then what would it take to bump that up from a five to a six or seven? Not from a five to a 10, that's asking them to go too far, but what would it take to bump that up from a five to a, a six or a seven? See if they could come up with one more reason. Going to very briefly go over the MI micro skills. They're open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening and summarizing open-ended questions, I'm gonna assume that you all know uh, are questions that are hard to answer with just a brief yes or no. Um, they contain an element of surprise. We don't really know what the person's gonna say. Uh, and they're conversational door openers. We're trying to, to engage people in conversation rather than asking them a checklist of closed-ended questions where they're just saying yes or no. Affirmations are positive reinforcement. We're just we want to offer some positive reinforcement for something. It needs to be authentic, can't be cheerleading. 
it needs to be an authentic affirmation. We can support and promote confidence and self-efficacy with an affirmation. We can acknowledge the real life challenges of the student. Wow, I get it, that's really hard. We can validate their experiences or their feelings and reinforcing success reduces discouragement and hopelessness. Might be something simple like, thanks for coming in today. Uh, I appreciate that you're willing to talk to me about your substance use. You're obviously a resourceful person to have recovered from that illness as you have. That's a good idea. It's hard to talk about drug use or your eating habits or your mental health or whatever you're talking with them about. I really appreciate your willingness to be honest with me. I think that's a really important one uh, to, is an important affirmation. I really appreciate your willingness to talk with me. Reflective listening. Most of us in the healthcare professions were trained to listen for the purpose of diagnosing and fixing a problem, right? That's kind of what we got trained to do. If you're listening for what's the problem, how do we diagnose it, and then how do we fix the problem? Reflective listening is not that. It, reflective listening is listening for the purpose of understanding. So I have a, a humorous video clip, and if I've set this up correctly, you should be able to see and hear the video clip. But this is a uh, kind of a humorous demonstration of why listening for the purpose of diagnosing and fixing the problem isn't always so helpful. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop things... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. Is. There is a reflective response, finally. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. So it's not about the nail not about fixing the problem. Sometimes people just need to be heard and understood. Uh, I imagine we've all had conversations that sound something like that. So reflective listening is used to check out whether we really understood the student. We can highlight the student's own motivation for change by reflecting it back to them. We can guide them towards a greater recognition of their problems and concerns. And we can reinforce statements indicating that the student is thinking about change. Uh, in other words, change talk is what that's called in MI. And then summary statements, which are sort of a collection of reflections. Uh, they can be used to link subtopics together or to transition to whatever the next topic might be. So the interaction style and micro skills of MI are designed to engage a student in a structured, constructive, supportive conversation about making significant changes like reducing or stopping their substance use. It communicates acceptance and respect for the student while gradually helping them, uh, helping to move them toward the choice to make changes that are in their own best interests. Okay, uh, talk a little bit about CBT and then we will wrap it up. CBT is a counseling slash teaching approach that's well suited to the resource capabilities of most programs or clinics. It doesn't take a lot to implement. It's been extensively evaluated in clinical trials, has lots of empirical support, both for mental health conditions and for substance use, and in all different types of populations. It's collaborative, it's structured, it's goal-oriented, and it's focused on the immediate problems faced by individuals using substances. It's flexible, it's individualized, and it can be adapted to a wide range of students as well as a, a variety of settings and formats, like you can use it in a group format versus 
an individual format. Uh, it works well either way. I'm gonna, just because I realize we don't have a whole lot of time left, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. So when we're CBT, we're thinking about conceptualizing behavior from a learning perspective. So we're thinking about it from classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and social learning theory. Classical conditioning is essentially the development of triggers. So repeated pairings of particular events, emotional states, or other cues with substance use can produce craving for the substance by seeing that trigger. Over time, substance use gets paired with cues like money, drug paraphernalia, particular places, people, times of the day, days of the week, and emotions. It gets, they get everything be, can become a, a, a trigger. And eventually exposure to the cues of the triggers alone produces drug or alcohol cravings. Really important to help students understand that classical conditioning takes place at an unconscious level. So they have no control over whether or not it takes place. Very often people come into uh, treatment settings and they have some guilt or shame uh, around their substance use and they don't understand. Sometimes they they have tried to cut down on it themselves and have been unsuccessful. So it's important to help them understand that some of what's going on in their brain takes place at an unconscious level. Therefore, they're not responsible for it. That's not saying that they're not responsible for their own choices. It's just saying that part of what happens with the development of substance use happens at an unconscious level. And once those, uh, those uh, responses are established, it requires careful, specific strategies to extinguish them. Operant conditioning is positive and negative reinforcement. Drug use is reinforced by the positive reinforcement that, that occurs from the, the high, the euphoria from the substance. Substance use is reinforced by the negative reinforcement of removing or avoiding painful withdrawal symptoms or other unpleasant experiences like depression or anxiety. So when I was talking earlier about kids learning from a relatively early age that if I use alcohol or a drug, it helps me get rid of my anxiety or depression feelings. That's negative reinforcement. By taking away something unpleasant, uh, we are reinforcing the use of the substance. Social learning theory is also part of this. Uh, behavior isn't fully explained by the principles of conditioning, and especially with teens, learning occurs in a social context. Uh, we might call it a dynamic and reciprocal interaction of the person, environment, and behavior. It's one thing to initiate new behavior, it's another thing to maintain it. So CBT attempts to help students follow a planned schedule of lower risk activities, help them recognize high risk situations and avoid those situations, and cope more effectively with a range of problems and problematic behaviors associated with their substance use. So maybe help them cope with better with their anxiety or with their depression, for instance. CBT is used to teach, encourage, and support individuals about how to reduce or stop their harmful drug use. Provide skills to help people achieve initial abstinence and to sustain abstinence or to reduce their substance use. The early stages of CBT treatment strategies emphasize behavior change and include setting a schedule to promote engagement in behaviors that are inconsistent with substance use, recognizing and avoiding high-risk situations, people, places, et cetera. And that's a really important one. Uh, and it can be challenging for students, especially if there is substance use going on in their home. Uh, like I, I, in one study I showed on Thursday, for those of you who are here on Thursday with us, 70% um, of high school students in one sample said that there was substance use going on in the family at home. So that's a huge risk factor, uh, and it makes it very difficult for students to stop using if there is substance use going on in the home and facilitating positive coping skills. As CBT continues, more emphasis is given to the cognitive aspects of it. So that includes psychoeducation on the effects of substances in the brain, teaching students about triggers and cravings, teaching them cognitive skills like thought stopping and urge surfing, and identifying red flag thoughts, so thoughts that might lead them to using their drug or alcohol. So summarizing CBT consists of behavioral strategies, so scheduling and avoidance of high-risk situations, cognitive strategies, recognizing triggers and cravings, doing some thought stopping, recognizing red flag thoughts, and, and analysis of the chain of events that results in a slip 
or a lapse or, or doing, in other words, doing a functional analysis or a relapse analysis, which we don't really have time to go into today. Optimally, CBT strategies can be used while using a style of interaction that's consistent with motivational interviewing. So more and more lately, CBT and MI are being combined. So we talk about using an interaction style consistent with motivational interviewing. Within that, making use of strategies, strategies and techniques from CBT. And CBT effects are robust across alcohol and many types of drugs. Final note on treatment, involve parents or caregivers whenever possible. Again, that often is helpful, but if depending on what's going on in the home, depending on the attitude of the parents, that may not in some cases be so helpful. Adolescent substance use does often reflect underlying problems or dynamics at home. Parents are often part of the problem and should be part of the solution when possible. Whenever I don't, I don't see typically high school students, I do see sometimes 18 year olds, 19 year olds. Uh, whenever they come in, they get referred to me for whatever it is, whether it's substance use or mental health issues, I wanna meet with the parents. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, very often after I spend 45 minutes or an hour with the parents, I come away from that session thinking, oh my God, no wonder your kid uses drugs. So really important to, if, if you can, to involve the parents or the family in the situation. And brief strategic family therapy is an evidence-based approach that can be helpful in changing patterns of family interactions that are helping to maintain adolescent substance use. And with that, I will open it up. We've got just a couple of minutes to talk for questions uh, and uh, anything that you, I have been not been paying attention to the chat box. Uh, so if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat box. Jim, I think most of the questions in the chat box have gotten answered, but there was a question in the Q&A about which opioid is more at risk to be used post-alcohol marijuana use that you referenced um, early during the statistics? Um, that's a really good question. And I don't know if any work has been done to sort of try to quantify that, um, but definitely heroin and illicit opioids uh, are more at risk to be used post-alcohol and marijuana use. Um, I think that for prescription opioids, they are um, sometimes misused before alcohol and marijuana are used. Thank you so much. And I think that's all the questions, except just a reminder to everyone that we will be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint as well as the recording, as well as additional resources. Um, and also that there is our statewide conference on November 2nd through 4th. We'll send out a link to that as well. Oh, one last question just came in. Um, do you think that the rates that have seen a decline in cigarette opioids are due to adolescents replacing with other that's a really great question. Um, I don't know that anybody has postulated an explanation for that, um, but that's a really great question. And how about resources around ACEs when parents have um, substance use disorder and about the impact of substance use disorder of parents on younger kids? Um, in other words, the impact of parental substance use on Correct. kids. Yeah, th that is one of the things that they looked at in the ACEs study. Um, and they definitely, parental substance use was one of the risk factors, uh, was one of the adverse childhood experiences that they identified that make kids more susceptible to mental health and substance use problems down the road. Thank you. And I know we're at time and that um, Brandy has some evaluation information for us. So we'll pause there, but we will send out additional resources. All right, thank you everyone. I just, I'll do my quick little spiel. Um, I'm gonna post right now the link in the chat to our evaluation as well as the end code because um, we're at the top of the hour or the end of the session. Um, so basically we hope everyone fills out the evaluation. It really just helps us with feedback and getting information from you all. If you need CE credit, that's where you need to listen to the next step. At the very end of the GIPRA will be links to the CE evaluation. So you'll just click the link that corresponds to your discipline, 
fill out another quick survey. That's where you're going to enter your start and end codes, and we will be sending you the certificates via email. If you just need a certificate of attendance, please still just fill out the, uh, the evaluation. We'd love to hear from you, um, but you don't need to do the last step, which is the CE evaluation. And um, Amy and her team are going to send out an email with these instructions, and it'll also have my email just in case, you know, you have a question about the CE process. Um, and that's about it. So thank you so much. Thank you so and much. And the end code, end code, folks, is 2947. So if you would like that one hour of CE, please write down 2947 because you'll be asked for it on the CE evaluation. And thank you so much to Dr. Peck, and thank you so much to UCLA ISAP, and to your California, and to the California Alliance, and the California School Nurses Organization. We hope to see you all again soon. Take care. Take care, everybody.